So I think I've just met most of you uh, in, in the hall. If, if you weren't in the uh, main session, I'm Katie Day. I'm Director of Strategy at Transport for the North. And I'm really, really pleased to be leading this panel session this morning. Um, this is a topic close to my heart. Um, when I started my civil service career 20 plus years ago, I was working on how you transform the lives for people in communities by um, you know, what we can do around social inclusion. So when I walked into TFN almost a year ago and we were talking about putting transport related social exclusion at the heart of our strategic transport plan, as Martin Tugwell's just talked about, um, I thought that was a, a great step forward. Um, Thank you for joining us. Um, we are aiming to finish up by about half past 12. We'll, we'll see how the mood takes us and how many difficult questions you've got for us. Um, but as we are in uh, Liverpool, um, I'm going to ask our panels just say who they are and where, where they're from in true Scylla Black style. So, oh. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, Can we have the roving? Excellent. Work. There we go. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Nicola Kane. I'm Director at STEER, which is a Transport Planning Consultancy. Uh, before joining STEER, I was Head of Strategic Planning at Transport for Greater Manchester. I'm going to try without the mic, if that's okay. Uh, my name's Jason Prince, and I am Director of the Urban Transport Group. I can be loud as well, but I'll <laughs> use the mic to be even louder. Yeah, I'm Brian Deegan. I'm the Director of Inspections at Active Travel England, so representing the government today. <laughs> Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Beth Bayer. I am from South Yorkshire's Mayoral Combined Authority as the Acting Exec Director of Transport. Hi everyone, good morning. I'm Tom Jarvis. I'm Principal Social Researcher at Transport for the North. Thank you, panel. So uh, um, we can leave the mics, I think. Hopefully they'll all work in a mo. Um, so just, just to set the scene before I invite the panel um, to give you their thoughts on this subject. So you might hear us talk about TRSE. We do love a good acronym in the public sector. So if you hear us mention that, it's Transport Related Social Exclusion. And I'm just going to start by reminding us all again of that headline that Martin spoke about. 3.3 million people are at high risk of social exclusion because of transport in our region. That's 21% of the population. That compares to 16% of populations elsewhere in the country. And our ambition is to reduce that figure by 1 million. Now, you can chuck a question at us later, why not be more ambitious? We've done a lot of digging around that, and I will defer to Tom on that question, but we want to set something that's realistic but ambitious. So we've baked that reduction by one million into that strategic transport plan. And just a little bit about what TRSE is. It, it's a combination of factors that prevents people realising their full potential. That could be poor access to key destinations with the options available, especially those public transport choices. This morning, I made the conscious decision to get the train. It would have taken me an hour and 15 minutes to get here in the car. It took me nearly three hours on the train because the train was canceled, then delayed, had to wait for the connection. It stopped everywhere. And actually, when you think about it, if you've only got those choices, it perhaps limits what can you do in terms of employment? Where can I get to realistically in the morning? And that can have knock-on consequences such as cost, stress and time. Now, I was not stressed this morning because I have a brilliant comms team that have been putting this event together and, and I'd asked my head of strategy to stand in as compare this morning. So we had, a, we had a backup plan. But actually, when you add all those things up together, it results in the inability to, hope, to participate fully in society to maximise those opportunities. And it's quite frightening when I talk to businesses that are wanting to expand perhaps their operations from Newcastle to come to Manchester and they said they cannot rely on the transport networks to get them there. And so they're not making note, they're not coming to Manchester or they're not going to Newcastle. And TRSE can affect almost anyone, but the evidence that we've got, that we've seen, that, that Tom and his team have led, shows us it particularly impacts on those that are on low income and insecure work, people with disabilities or with long-term health conditions, and people with caring responsibilities as well and actually disproportionately impacts women, some ethnic minority communities, and LBTQ plus as well. And those all lead then, when you add all those factors up, that there comes this vicious cycle of poor active travel conditions and car-dominated environments. Issues within the public transport system, such as fragmentation, affordability, and reliability. If your train gets in and the bus has just pulled away and you've got to be in work in 10 minutes, that, that's really not going to be helpful and potentially force car ownership and car dependency because actually you can't rely on the public transport system or you can't access it. 
And what happens is we get greater constraints on the available transport options, greater consequences when journeys go wrong, and a greater need to travel, particularly outside of peak times and best served routes. Nothing quite explains all this like a story, though. So a very quick story before I invite our panel to, to give their thoughts. Take someone working on a zero hours contract at a warehouse. The bus is the only option that they can afford to get to work and they buy a monthly pass to save a little bit of money on the fares. That pass is their entire transport budget. Their shift starts at 7, so they take the bus at 6am. They get a connecting bus at 6.20. It's a tight transfer, but it usually works. Now imagine if that first bus is cancelled. They can't get the next one because it, the one that arrives at their stop is actually operated by a different company and they won't accept their ticket. And they don't have the money for another fare. So they wait for the seven o'clock service when they can actually use their pass. The traffic's worse at that time, so they then miss the 20 past seven connection. They're now an hour and a half late for work. And when they arrive, the shift manager says, I'm really sorry, there's nothing to give you for a day's work today. So losing that money then makes, it compounds the problem. It makes their ne next bus pass unaffordable in one go. So they end up buying an everyday ticket because that's all they can afford, spending more and potentially, dare I say, risking people being pushed into debt or perhaps having to make other life choices, which I think we've seen widely covered in the press during the cost of living crisis. Because actually they haven't got reliable public transport and having a car isn't an option. We know TRSE is an issue, it's a big issue and it has only got worse since COVID and the cost of living crisis. But what we know is that actually when you start to consider connectivity policy levers and investment to reduce transport related social exclusion, such as, you know, thinking about health, education, social care, for example, the opportunities are far greater than the sum of their parts. And we can help more people access those opportunities as well. I do always love the example, if you talk to Martin Tugwell, talk about the hospital, asking the local authority to grip pavements outside the hospital because it prevents people from breaking arms and legs. It's the safe walking route to school that means actually the family do get their 10,000 steps in a day. And it's the great public transport that can actually help social cohesion, connecting people to each other, helping address loneliness perhaps. Maybe it is just the people you meet on the bus or that you can get to recreational facilities or leisure opportunities. It's why we need a socially inclusive transport system because actually when we start to address transport and we think about all the other policy levers that are connected, we start to help society. But our transport system is deeply unequal the numbers that we've given this morning speak for themselves. We're setting the ambition to try and change that. The research and the evidence says we've got to change that, but it needs us to work together. It's why our theme today is Transform the North, because when we work together, we can transform the North. When we bring all the partners together, we bring the right policies together, we really can. So, how can we transform social inclusion in the North? Panel, let's get your perspective on this. Nicola, I'll come to you first, yeah, please. Morning, everyone. Um, I think it's absolutely fantastic that TFN have put um, transport-related social exclusion back on the agenda. It's a hugely important topic, um, but it has made me feel slightly old because I'm starting to get to that age where things are coming round again <laughs> that I've seen before. Um, and I remember um, back in 2003 when I was still quite a young transport planner, and the, trans and the social exclusion unit published um, a really fantastic report called Making the Connections, which was all about transport-related social exclusion, um, and did a really good analysis of all the problems that we were facing, and really put it on the agenda at a national level. Um, and we all went off and started producing lots of accessibility plans. I think every local authority had to produce an accessibility plan as part of their LTP. I think I worked with one on you, Hugh, <laughs> with one with you. Um, and that was great. Again, lots of really good analysis of the problem. But we've not really succeeded, I think, in actually translating um, all of that into, into action for a whole host of reasons. Um, partly because I think a lot of these problems are very big, part of a big systemic set of issues. Um, poor integration of land use planning and transport at a more strategic level, putting services in the wrong places which make them inaccessible. Lack of revenue funding, and we've seen that as being a major major issue around things like bus bus funding, um, and also I think 
probably a lack of time spent actually talking to real people about the problems that they face. Um, and, and not because we don't want to, but I think because you know, we're trying to tackle all sorts of different issues and actually to taking the time to really speak to people about the day-to-day -day problems they face is time-consuming, but I think it's really important if we're going to get, um, if we're going to really tackle some of these, these big problems. But I sort of feel like there are some opportunities now, which maybe there weren't when the Social Exclusion Unit came, came out. Um, I think we're starting to make progress with integrating land use and transport, certainly work that um, uh, I was involved with in Greater Manchester around places for everyone and bringing that together with a local transport plan is starting to make a difference and people are much more aware now that we need to think much more about where we put essential services. Buses are back on the agenda. Franchising, I think, gives us a new, potentially a new um, set of levers that we haven't had previously. Things like the £2 fare cap, massively important, I think, in terms of making buses more affordable for people. Uh, and I'm sure, as Brian will talk about, active travel has gone way up the agenda. And all those short trips that I think are so important for people accessing day-to-day -day opportunities, thinking about particularly the role of walking, getting to local um, local opportunities, um, is huge. Uh, so I'm, I'm feeling cautiously optimistic that actually this work is coming around again but that we've got a real chance of really grasping some of these issues um, but it's multifaceted and it's not going to be straightforward Nicola, thank you uh, thank you Nicola Nicola and I know each other for a while so it's good to be uh, on a panel together from our days at TFGEM so uh, firstly it's great to be in a panel here today and uh, as a mank uh, it's nice to be in Liverpool uh, so uh, great city uh, to be fair so uh, so I was reading uh, over the weekend, just preparing for the panel and having a, uh, a, a sort of do, looking at the report, actually. And uh, some of the uh, numbers are quite startling, but I think it, the ambition is fantastic. And I think what's one thing which is quite important uh, for me, which is why I think it's really what the panel has done, is actually, could we say, as everyone in a room, that social exclusion is part of an overall strategy for transport at national level. I don't think we could really suggest that's the case. And actually, I would even argue that we probably don't have a national transport strategy per se, uh, a national level. So if you don't have an overall strategy of what public transport should be, then how can you then start to think about some of the challenges about how we address particular things which are highlighted in the work from TFM about social inclusion. Now, that isn't to say that there isn't work already being done around social inclusion. And I think more recently, uh, the Green Book was updated in 2022, which did start to take much more of account of social value. And that's a positive change. Uh, but I think where we're tackling this, I think this is where something uh, in terms of social exclusion that I welcome the work and what TFN have done with the, trust, with the draft plan, which is really vitally important, because when you start to look at devolved areas, whether it's at TFN, uh, uh, like sub-regional level, or what you're seeing in our members, so all our members from Urban Transport Group, we have 14 members, and seven of the members are the big local transport authorities, TFL, uh, GM, South Yorkshire, as Pat will know. Uh, and we're, they're starting to, through their local uh, plans, and also through their approach, particularly with the B network, start to think about social value, start to think about how we uh, tackle social exclusion. And I think that's really important. My husband is disabled. He has a disability. He cannot drive. He is purely dependent on public transport. And when I'm not around, I probably get two or three calls a week about which tram line do I need to get here or what bus goes there. He has a particular route to work. He knows he can trust that, that, that bus. And I think one thing the B Network in Manchester has done fantastically well is actually bring a new app where he can now see where the bus is or have real-time information. That is a revolution outside of London. I mean, who would have thought in 2024 you can actually get real-time information about where a bus is? And so it makes me think quite differently about actually when I have a husband who is purely dependent on public transport, it makes me think about actually the needs of those which we could argue on the margins. And I would, I believe that as pu both public transport authorities and at a national level, we shouldn't just think about the bulk, 
which is working people, which is predominantly where a lot of the thinking is about. We need to think about people who I don't think are on the periphery, but would be suggested to be on the periphery. My mother-in-law spends about £100 a month going to a hospital appointment. I mean, that's outrageous. And that comes from her pension. So I think great work from TFN about putting this on the agenda and in the... I hate holding the mic. I can hear him like... Is it too close or too far? <laughs> Let's pass it on. It's I'll pass it. Uh, that's why I did it. Did it. I'll be very quick. Great that TFN uh, have put this on the agenda. It's great that... And I can think, as Nicholas said, the work at a devolved level is really positive. Well, but I think my ask is what needs to be done about how do we further embed this thinking at a national level to really put those which aren't on the periphery at the heart of transport planning? Thanks, Jason. Oh, I better cover the national <laughs> level then. Um, yeah. So really, Active Travel England, we're trying to be champions of inclusivity and uh, accessibility. And I'll say them properly next time I say that. But uh, I'm going to attempt to, to show how do you understand other people's needs. And I thought I'd share a little bit of a story as well to get us going on this one. Um, so, you know, as an engineer, like, uh, let's go back 20 years ago, and I was doing cycling schemes in London. And uh, it was just all males using them. So we were going, well, how do we actually get women to cycle was the kind of question. So I didn't know. I was, uh, I was a man, and I'm replacing a woman on the panel today. So I thought I'd better, better talk about this. So I asked one. <laughs> I asked, like, a Professor Rachel Aldred. It's, it's radical, I know. But if you want to understand what people need, ask them. That's going to be the collision. So I went to Professor Rachel Aldred, who just in a paper asking women what they needed from infrastructure. I said, well, what do they want? And she gave me a list of all the things they were looking for in infrastructure. I'm like, yeah, can do, can do, can do, can do. And I designed a scheme that was answering all those needs. And I put it in in Camden. It was Royal College Street. It was like a, we then did a follow-up report. And it was the only route in London that had more women on it than men. So th there's an early conclusion there. And that's like, if you want to know what people want, why don't you just ask them? <laughs> and then it actually will work. And like, I could have spent a long time trying to figure out and I could have been looking at guidance. But it's just like, well, should we ask the people who are actually affected? And uh, just like uh, years later now that I'm in government, we've got all sets of tools and we're trying to look at all things for all users and trying to be as inclusive as possible. We ask people, uh, I was working on a scheme up as a consultant in Glasgow once and I went around with someone in a wheelchair and someone with visual impairment, just walking down the street, completely illuminating. Now I knew all the standard and all the guidance, but actually going around and going, actually, yeah, that, that curb's about 30 mil high, you can't get a mobility scooter off and on it. We had to go backwards and forwards across a dual carriageway to get up onto the curb and I was holding the road back. Understand, understood that user now. So like what, what I've learned is never to put something out thinking that I know, to ask all the people, to make sure that you get representative groups in there and they're picking up those things uh, with the new tools that we've got out, like I've uh, been working with DIPTAC, uh, Disabled Persons Transport Advisory Council, to go about camber all the time, crossfall on footways. It's just such a key issue for them. But it was like, yeah, we aim for a certain tolerance in engineering, but it's so crucial to their members that we brought it front and centre and up at the top. So I think there's a lesson to be learned by asking people, and uh, I'll probably leave it at that. That's brilliant. Thanks, Brian. I think you should have asked a Dutch woman <laughs> about cycling, but uh, there you go. Um, no, no um, I, one of the real key thoughts is public transport, and clue is in the word. It is a service for the public, and that means for everybody in the public. And that is difficult, that's complex, because people have different needs across different parts of society. But really, in South Yorkshire, we are trying to bring greater control over the public transport system. So bringing our tram system back into public control with effects from March 2024. And we're also investigating bus franchising at a pace um, not seen elsewhere in the country. So there's a level of urgency getting this right for our public and the members of our society. Um, the most vulnerable members of our communities are actually held back by poor public transport networks. Three quarters of our journeys are made by young people and they are for education and work. 
Um, women, the disabled, and those from a minority ethnic background are actually more likely to use bus, our bus network, and they are more likely to be disappointed by it. Um, for reasons of accessibility or lack of thereof and the quality of the fleets um, that um, is being operated. But also late notice service changes, for example, could be a real uh, painful impact on my disabled communities. So giving an example really of recent late bus no notification bus service changes. Imagine if you're uh, visually impaired and you need to learn how to walk to your bus stop and you need to learn how to get to the right, um, at the right time, to the right locations. Service changes have a severe impact on those communities and they are at risk of being cut off if we uh, don't make changes. Um, another key example, a recent bus service change where by an estate of uh, built for the elderly with health impairments was cut off uh, from their local GP. And it left some of the elderly in the, on the estate actually in a state of depression to severe consequences. So this is absolutely paramount that we make it an inclusive service for all that need that service. So <clears throat> just thinking about some stats and some interesting information, apologies for holding a piece of paper, but I don't remember all of these things. Um, my brain doesn't uh, stretch that far. But uh, fewer than 1% of South Yorkshire's residents live within 30 minutes by public transport from the first investment zone in the UK. So we're building a new economy out there to create great prosperity, greater jobs, and there's no transport connectivity to it. Really interesting stat. Also, what we need to get better at, as, a, as a, you know, generally uh, better at, is to design our transport systems with and as well f um, with, with our communities and for our communities. And it means that we need to create tailored solutions. You know, in fast moving c consumer goods, people are very clever at market segmentation and tailoring products to what the people actually need. We have a tendency to take a blanket approach and thinking that one size fits all. Well, it doesn't. So we have to be more clever in how we do things. So a few more stats. I've got lots on these, um, but I won't keep bore you with all of them. <laughs> so, um, I promise. Um, so young people, in particular public transport inequalities, reduce access to education, training opportunities, but also apprentice jobs, graduate jobs, all those things. And it means that we don't provide access to that young generation, three quarters of whom use the public transport network. That means that we inevitably create a perpetuating circle of those people never having an opportunity to grow in society. And I think that is absolutely fundamental. So disability, again, the bus is the most commonly used form of public transport amongst disabled people. And with disabled people having uh, likely to have um, no access to a car or unable to utilize a car, they are actually requiring better access to the public transport network. And the example that I gave earlier is a real good example of how important it is to give that stability but also certainty of access. And minority ethnic. So the South Yorkshire Travel Survey of 2022 uncovered that significantly more people from a, um, a black, Asian and minority ethnic community are recorded as a bus user compared to the average across South Yorkshire. So 80% of that community compared to 60% of the overall community. And 27% of that group stated that they used the bus five days a week, while the average fi figure was 12% in that survey. What is really important is that that same group feel unsafe to travel and feel it's not accessible to them. And this is where we need to improve. So we are actually not doing the right thing by saying, let's keep those communities excluded and uh, leaving them without an access to a public transport network. Many more stats to come, so <laughs> watch this space. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Thank you. I, admit, I, I very much enjoy being at this end of a panel because it means the, the majority of the hard work has already been done for me with regards to explaining this issue. So I'll make uh, a few points relatively quickly reflecting on some of what uh, Transport for the North research has shown about this issue and uh, a very little bit on the, the strategy that we developed out of our research on this. So most fundamentally, there's, there's two sides to the issue of transport-related social exclusion. On the one hand, you have an unequal society and on the other hand you have an unequal transport system and TRC is essentially what happens when you combine those two things together. And that means that the solutions to the issue can act through both of those sets of influences. It's not just changing the transport system, it's also changing things like 
the insecure work example that Katie gave there. That's a significant part of that, uh, that person's experience. It's also about the location and position of things like community support services or community health services, how close they are to their users, as well as how well people can travel to hospitals or otherwise. And it's also the impact of the gaps that exist around the welfare state that allow people to fall through into poverty when they do feel the impacts of transport issues and other issues in their everyday life. And I hope I'm holding the microphone close enough for you to actually, actually hear me. I'm getting a nod from the back, which is fantastically reassuring. So on the transport side, fundamentally to make meaningful progress on this issue, we need targeted investment in areas and communities that are feeling the risk of transport-related social exclusion the most. Um, it's a very obvious point to make, but in order to reach a more equal transport system, fastest progress is needed among those who are most disadvantaged. If everyone feels benefits equally, you're simply perpetuating a system that is just as unequal as the one is now. The fastest progress is needed in areas and communities that face the most disadvantage. And that is a, is a simple premise. I got a couple of nods in the audience when I made that, made that point, suggesting it was a fairly obvious one to make, but it's a pretty radical departure from how transport systems are planned and developed now. The Green Book changes and reforms have certainly improved things, but fundamentally you're often still disincentivized from investing in areas and in communities that don't make regular business journeys or don't make regular commuting trips. And that means that transport investment can tend to favor people who are already reasonably well connected to jobs, perhaps improving the journeys of those that make a lot of business trips rather than improving access to key everyday destinations for all of the population, particularly those who are relatively disadvantaged. And part of that, and we've already heard quite a lot this morning uh, about local public transport and local bus services in particular. A big part of that 3.3 million figure that Katie uh, introduced is the impact of bus service cuts on our region. We've lost over a third of our bus service mileage uh, since 2010. And our research clearly shows that th this was not excess or waste wasted unused services. These were services that people were relying on. And the things that people now have to do in order to cope with the impacts of those service cuts really come across very clearly in our research. And frankly, our research shows that not only do we need that lost mileage back, those lost services back, we need to go much further than that. Our population has grown fairly considerably since 2010, and we need a level of bus service and other local public transport service that matches that population growth and delivers people access to key destinations. And finally, that means some fairly, fairly significant impacts for the model of decarbonisation that we take in our, in our transport system. If the story of the next 25 years is simply the majority of people swapping from one variety of car to another variety of car, we're going to perpetuate a system that is just as unequal or probably more unequal than the one that we have now. Both mode shift and uh, demand management need to be at the heart of how we decarbonise. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to summarise the things that have come through because actually I know time is short today and we'd like to take your questions. Um, so I'm going to, I've, I've, I've got my trusty assistants here in the form of, of Simon and Donna. So we're going to pass around one of the roving mics. This gentleman here. If you could just say who you are and where you're from as well. We like to, we like to feel included in the room. I was going to do that anyway, I promise. No, sorry. Uh, hi all, my name is Jude Daniel-Smith. Um, uh, I'm wearing the hat of sort of young people uh, and exclusion to transport and in inclusion in public transport. Uh, so I'm 19 years old. I've actually just moved from Sheffield to Bristol, sadly. Oh. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in the you. lovely north. I'm sorry. You. I'm loving it there. It is great. But, you know, I, um, I'm missing the north quite a lot. Uh, I'm still in Sheffield all the time. I work in community transport in Sheffield and South Yorkshire. Um, but I've also had quite a lot to do with young people and transport inclusion in South Yorkshire. So it was... Um, me and some colleagues who actually brought the idea of the Zoom Pass to Dan Jarvis back in 2021. Um, so the Zoom Pass, for anyone in the room who doesn't know, it effectively lowered the fare uh, for all buses in South Yorkshire from the adult fare, which was at the time a minimum of £2.20. This is uh, April 2021. And it loaded it to 80p for all of those all the way up to the age of 21, um, which was the child fare at the time. That has since, since November 1st gone 
up to £1.50. So that's sort of one of the things that I'm wanted to talk about. This is coming from a two-pronged approach. It's about sort of um, increasing accessibility for young people, but also for people on low incomes. Um, now, the reason why we tried to get this pass pushed through was because there was a student fair in South Yorkshire for anyone who was attending university, which is great because that can also help those who aren't of that young age but might be 50 and studying. My mum was one of them. She was studying at Sheffield Hallam uh, and she benefited from the bus because that's where, how she, she got to... Uh, that's how she got to campus every morning, which was great. It was it was one pound at the time when we, we got the Zoom pass in. Um, it's that has also now gone up to one pound fifty. There's a theme here. Uh, I think you can see it. Um, but we wanted to get it because there were people who were not at NUS accredited universities, people who were at colleges, people who were doing apprenticeships, going to measly at the time four pound twenty an hour wage. Um, and there were people who were simply looking for jobs and they needed to get to interviews and they couldn't do that if they were paying £2.20 to £2.40 per single journey uh, upwards of £5 for a return uh, for some routes. So um, we said, yeah, let's try and sort of get these young people who've just come from, you know, mandatory up to 18 education and see if they can get about. Now, we saw uh, some modelling was done in, April, in June 2021 when it was brought in and it said in a year it's going to increase usage by a million, it hit that target by... November of that year, so it was quite good. So my, my question is, sorry for the preamble, but my question is, um, how can we sort of look, how can these new sort of tools at our disposal, such as franchising, uh, and such as sort of taking uh, buses and also rail back and light rail trams into public control, how can we use these new tools to get more young people and those who simply don't have access to the uh, to high incomes to, to, uh, to afford public transport, how can we start getting them on board and feeling welcomed again because i think that the biggest thing that i've been hearing from young people in south yorkshire is they no longer feel welcome on public transport simply because they can't afford it thanks do thank you and um, you know glad you're here in the north i'm not in bristol me too, much, me much, too, don't worry. i'm a southerner so i'm allowed to say that <laughs> love the north i'm going to ask the panel just to hold the thought about engaging young people in your minds because i'm going to take a few other questions from the floor um, because I, I'm also conscious we have got a bus panel this afternoon as well. And I think they'll, I think this will be a running theme through the day, actually. We won't be talking about railways as much today. It'll be buses. Um, this gentleman at the front here, please. It's, 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 is it? Uh, I think we best using that one. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 Great. I so, promise you, we yeah. did do sound checks immediately before yeah. everyone arrived this morning. Ooh. Yeah, great. So I'm Councillor William Shortall. Um, I'm the bus lead for the Liverpool City Combined Authority. Uh, region and um, I'm going to say all the examples you gave here uh, I can uh, associate with all those examples Kate yours ones is a, is a typical example we get all the time at the local authority which the chambers just over there by the way so that gets asked by people all the time and um, one of the questions I want to ask is I, I could go on about uh, lots of difference and Jason York was an excellent question by the way in terms of I get that all the time but one of my key objectives, because you, you have a, a limited amount of objectives, otherwise you'll get nowhere, was the safety of women and girls was one of my key objectives. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't matter whether it's a bus or a train. On a train, you've got nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And you get people, while they might want to step in, they feel embarrassed stepping in, or they don't want to take the consequences of stepping in because um, you know things might turn out really worse than you think. Mm -hmm. And I've been on a bus myself, and there's been, there's, there are always drunken men uh, and young girls, uh, I've never seen uh, or never heard of a drunken woman groping a man. Uh, that's never came up. But the safety issue is is, is paramount there, and yeah. uh, the people just get away with it, or they do stuff. Or I want to know about the panel thing on that. What? Because being feeling safe on the bus is key. It really is key. Thanks for that. That's a good, very good point. But you got a lot of support there. Um, I'm going to just see if there's another question, then we'll perhaps open it up just to, to other members. I think the young people, the safety point, the safety one that can come out. So I, I'm going to take uh, De Denise uh, and the gentleman behind you in glasses. We'll take those two and then, panel. perhaps you could have a think about young people and come back on the safety point. I'll perhaps come to, to Brian first. Thank you. I think I've come here looking for answers and maybe I'm going away with far more, more questions. Um, Denise Rollo, I'm the from the new council, Cumberland. Um, and as you all know, that's very rural and we have some areas of deprivation. And what I've found going through some of the communities is we've got three cut-off communities where their bus service was cut. We have the BSIP funding. That doesn't go very far because it's not an awful lot of money, is it? Um, and also, we're 
I will say the word stuck with a commercial bus service who obviously want to, you know, make, make money out of it. So how do other councils work in this situation where you want to provide the best for your communities with the little you've got? Obviously, you know, you, you can only raise so much through, you know, through through the council. Um, it's just it's just it's just a complete funding nightmare to be fair and what we want to do is get these people to move because they're the ones that are clogging in my inbox saying i can't get to the shops i can't get to the doctors and it is a real problem i'm i'm going to take that question and i'm going to refer it to our bus panel as well this afternoon actually denise because um we've got some excellent speakers there including our bus lead and it and we've just heard it time and time again um, that people just can't access the places they need to get to as a result of it. Gentleman behind you, the glasses. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm um, Callum Curry and I work at Transport North East on the uh, bus reform team. Oh, hi, um, it's, it's not a particularly bus related question, <laughs> so it's, I'm, I'm hoping we, we might be able to address it here. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to rationalise at the moment is the relationship between transport poverty and transport-related social exclusion. Um, it, it's come up time and time again um, as we've been writing some of the reports that we've been doing, and we're, I'd, I'd just really appreciate some clarity on the relationship between the two of them. Um, would you suggest that they are treated as independent, um, uh, as independent things, or does transport poverty simply inform transport-related, sorry, and affect transport-related social exclusion? Well, thank you. Um, we, we're quite happy to have lots of bus questions. Um, as I said, I'm, I may pick and choose a little bit. We did have a, we did have a thing that buses might feature today. What I'm going to say is I'm going to ask Tom to come back on that question, if I may, because I know there's lots in our research. But perhaps I might then come to, to Brian, Jason and then Nicola just for some views on that point about engaging young people, but I think the safety of women and girls as well. And if there are any tips that you've got for Denise, great um, uh, as well. But we'll <coughs> definitely make sure that it gets picked up this afternoon. Tom. Thank you very much for that question. I, I was very briefly a, a fairly bad academic, so I very much enjoy conceptual discussions. Uh, so thank you, thank you for asking about that. Um, transport poverty and uh, transport-related social exclusion are related concepts. Um, the difference between the two comes in those who travel very little or don't travel at all, um, in that if you have very few or no available transport options, you've really cut down on your... Uh, discretionary transport spending or perhaps on all your transport spending, we wouldn't generally describe you as being in transport poverty. It's not having a major financial impact on your, on your household directly at least. So transport poverty tends to relate most closely to those who are pushed into financial hardship by their transport spending and it is a wide widespread experience. It's a very important part of the issue. But transport related social exclusion is a broader concept that includes transport poverty but also includes things like as well as those who can't travel those whose journeys are affordable, but those whose journeys are very, very stressful or impacts their well-being severely. The safety example that the gentleman there mentioned is a, is a classic manifestation of that. It might not be affordability or poverty that's the key issue. It might be the impact on your mental health, on your well-being from travelling. Um, but I'll, I'll happily, if you'd be interested, provide a bit more of a, a detailed response around that uh, via, via email, share some reports and further information around that. So thank you for your question. Brian, that comes to you. Just we've heard a few themes there. What are your thoughts on what you've you've heard from some of the questions there? Yeah, I thought I might get into the safety thing, uh, particularly about women, but it's a, it's about many people as well. And it, there's a campaign going on in London about safety for female cyclists as well to take it back to my active travel comfort zone, and, and certainly like about making safe walking environments to actually get to the bus to use it in the first place is a is a kind of key one as well um it's interesting like in in manchester like the bus was always a safe haven like i'm i'm from moss side in manchester and people had to get the bus to go through my area because no one would walk through it as well so it's interesting how things have turned around over the years and and without getting too sociological in fact i'm going to get too sociological <laughs> really like people of uh thatcher's children like myself like uh, put it down to that like a uh, corrosion of community cohesion, you know, which is something that we all have to take and the, the fact that you had responsibility for people and everybody was out in the street and everybody knew each other's business. So it, it was harder to do the antisocial stuff. Um, there are like more practical ways of tackling it, like, uh, you know, the, all the buses in London have got the cameras on and stuff and they'll report it straight to the police if there is any kind of incident. So I think we can deal with the situation we've got. 
but there's also like there's so many variables here to, to deal with and I think you know we've got to take them on but I can't help feeling that kind of community thing and that sense of social responsibility is, is a key bit that we can't miss even when our bus services. And just to tie it back into the kids' ones as well, it is about like a, getting people more free range out and about, looking after people. That's the big problem in the UK as we see it as a whole is this lack of mobility. And you see the maps of children from about the ages like uh, 40 years ago, they used to have a 50 mile range and now it's about six metres to the fridge and to the telly. Like uh, uh, we have to tackle those big ones as well. And the more people are out and about, the more you do get that sense of fair play in society. So I've gone way off government piece there and we'll hand it over. I, uh, not, not at all. And it's really interesting, isn't it? You know, for, 40 years ago, I thought nothing of getting on the bus and going for miles and my mum would let me do that. Friends now won't let their children do it. They are worried for their safety. They'll, they're just about let them on the school bus, and even then, they don't always feel safe. So, it's it. it we I, I think it's actually a point that we as as TFN want to come back to because it's it's great that we're talking about TRSE, but the safety point has come out time and time again as we've consulted on our strategic transport plan. Jason, reflections from you on the, the questions we've had. Young people, it's not always about price. It's about connectivity. I think they are hand in hand. Uh, I was in Scotland last year at the SNP conference, which is part of my job to go all to the different party conferences. And what Scotland have done uh, around uh, uh, free bus travel, I think it's up to 24, is it? Uh, 22. 22. Uh, and that's had a really positive impact. Uh, and the transport minister, like, she, she was using her example of she has three kids and now two don't really care about getting a driving licence. They, they're more important about having a bus pass. And that's, that's why I think it's, it's quite bold what they've done. But also connectivity is really important. Uh, when uh, the Metrolink over in Manchester towards uh, the more deprived east, uh, the, the connectivity and the opportunity available to young people dramatically increased. I think it was over a two-thirds increase for people, for particularly young people, to access education, employment, which were probably never open to them before. So, that's, so I think it goes hand in hand, cost and connectivity. I think on uh, violence against women and girls, uh, uh, travel champions, uh, Laura Shove and Anne Shaw, uh, they're two, I would say, if you haven't read their report, please do, and they did recommendations to government uh, about what can be done about safety. Uh, I've recently moved house and I've seen two instances already in the local transport network where there was uh, unsavoury, very not nice activity towards women and it's just not acceptable. But I think we have to remember that there's, this is, it's not just happening on transport. It was, so what can we do to make transport, if someone is in a vulnerable position on transport, what can we do to make people feel safe and how can they deal with that situation? I think there's some positive learning in GM, uh, and I said that because I live in Greater Manchester, which uh, can be taken and explored. But there's also a wider societal issue as well, which has to be addressed. Uh, and I think some local areas are doing that well. I think on uh, uh, Cumberland, congratulations. Uh, more than happy to pick up afterwards. Maybe got some names to connect. And on Nexus, I'm up there on Wednesday, so let's have a chat. Um, yeah, I'm quite keen to pick up on the um, issue about women women and sort of feeling safe when travelling. I think it's a massive issue, and I think it comes back again to having diversity within within the profession, um, people who've got different lived experiences. I mean, I've never I've never actually directly experienced any problems when when travelling, but I always feel nervous, particularly on the last bit of the journey, the walk from the tram stop back to my house. Not very far, but you're always looking around, you're always nervous. Um, that's the bit that will stop people travelling, um, even if they haven't actually experienced anything directly. And I think unless you've experienced that yourself, it's very hard uh, to understand what, what that feel, feels like. Again, it's not a simple problem to tackle, but we need to be looking at it from everything, from awareness, from those campaigns, which are starting to happen at a national and, and a local level, which just makes everyone more aware of how their behaviour affects how other people feel. I think design is massively important. The end-to-end -end journey is hugely important. And I suppose, again, as cities start to take control of things like bus networks, they can think much more strategically about not just 
when people are on the bus, but when they're waiting at a bus stop, how they're going to get to to and from that bus stop, and and really plan that in a in a much more holistic way, um, and and then training as well, and training um, for for staff on the, on the network, how they can um, make people feel, feel safer and know what to do in a in a in a situation. So I think that it's multifaceted, but really really important, and otherwise we're potentially excluding sort of fifty percent of the population from travelling, particularly after dark. I think it's worth remembering. I, Nicola and I have talked about this at length in, in other in other forums, but our transport system is deeply unequal for a reason. It's to do with the decisions and how things have been planned and executed. So actually, the point that I think several of the panel members have said, talk to real people. Um, I, I, I love your example, Brian, of the cycle way. Actually, just go and ask. Go and have the conversation. What is it that you need? What does it look like? What will make you feel safe? Um, so, and, I, and I, I don't think Martin was, I don't think he's here now, but I think if he was here, because I know he said this as well, this, we can do this now. As a transport profession, we can go out and ask people, what do you need? What does it look like? You know, let's go and talk to the communities. Um, so I, I think that's a, a big takeaway already. We've got a bit more time for a few more questions. I know some other hands. So I'll come to this gentleman here, and then I'll come to you. Can I have a, ask a question about unconscious bias? Because we, we talk about design standards and stuff like that, and <coughs> going out and talking to the community being one of the best ways to get around that. Um, but then we've got the minimum viable product in trying to find what we can actually deliver, and there seems to be a bit of a contradiction in that. And when we listen to people's experience, we also get different kind of feedback in different directions, and we often just try and keep it simple and go, oh, well, we, we know better and we'll do what we've always done, which doesn't work. So I was wondering if the, the panel could talk a bit about unconscious bias and how that might... Like, like this morning with the travel disruptions, it's, it's kind of a, an inconvenience. It's not, on, on most of us here, it's not really going to impact our livelihoods. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask Tom and then um, Jason, some thoughts on that one? Yeah, th thank you for that. Uh, I think it really matters who's, who is in the room and the, the diversity of those involved in the decisions when those uh, when those decisions are being made. Obviously, things do have to get simplified through through processes, but maintaining input from diverse groups of people throughout that process is, can minimise the impacts of uh, the biases that we all have and that we all bring based on our own uh, our own experiences and lives. I often, um, pretty much every time I come into Manchester City Centre, have to pass through a couple of underpasses that are very poorly accessible um, and I do that to avoid a bridge which is completely inaccessible to me as someone someone on a bike and I look at those and think it's not that the people who designed those were malicious they weren't uh, they weren't evil people it's just that it didn't really occur to them that someone might feel unsafe in that environment or someone might want to get around that environment with a pushchair or a wheelchair or something else um, so I said it's it's, it's ma maintaining diverse input throughout the process, I think, is key to that. Really good question. Uh, I think I think the panel said everything about making sure that, think about what the outcome and getting as many people from diverse backgrounds involved in decision making and planning. But I think one thing which actually we've all probably spoken about today is how you get transport people to places and I think one thing which struck me when I was in Wales last week I visited Cardiff and they've got a, a transport plan and the first thing if I'm correct someone might correct me on this on the transport strategy is about moving things closer to where people are not about moving people through transport to where places currently are and I think and that's the first thing they have uh, their transport strategy which I think is a really good way to think about things it's about thinking about place first thinking about how do we design places uh, rather than thinking how can we shuffle to people to where places are currently set up and picks up what Nicola said about places for everyone and I thought that given that's number one on their transport strategy outcome of three outcomes they have in I thought that was a really good way to start to think about things oh you you've, you've you're definitely in the uh, <laughs> S, uh, the STP world of being place-based and people focused 
Um, Hugh, let's have you all ask a question and then I'll perhaps invite Pat and Brian and Nicola just to reflect on the response to Hugh. No, thanks very much. I'm Hugh Jenkins, Lead for Transport from the Liverpool City Region Command Authority. So I've not come very far at all today, but <laughs> across the road. Did uh, you have any issues with the transport? No, the, I would have liked it to have stayed on green a little bit longer at the, uh, at the traffic lights, but uh, I'll, <laughs> I will pick that up with the, uh, the engineers at Liverpool City Council. A bit more green time would have been good for me, but there we go. Um, funny enough, uh, I think Jason's read my mind. My question was around place. Uh, and I guess it's a statement, but I'll try to turn it into a question at the end, that my very simple take on all of this, and like Nicola, you know, I've, I've seen this, I've lived this for a long, long time, and it's, it's quite frightening uh, how long it's taken us to get to where we're getting to now. But I've got a simple theory that we've got our priorities wrong. We've had our priorities wrong for too long, and we've simply planned for the needs of vehicles and not planned for the needs of people. We've got the, we've got the balance wrong. We've put all our value in the movement of vehicles and trucks and vans, and we've not put any value into the movement of people by different forms of transport. And land use decisions have made that worse because as more people have driven, we've displaced and dispersed and moved people out and made the problem worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, so, so my theory is that this is quite simple, that if we start planning for the movement and the needs of people first and people across all forms, all types, all needs um, and, and all, all backgrounds, if we start by planning for the needs of people first, we're more likely to get this right and that probably means making it a little bit more inconvenient, perhaps a lot more inconvenient to use a private car to make a short trip particularly. But for me, that's the right simplistic approach. Would anyone violently disagree with me? Well, I was going to say, I wonder, Brian, if I might come to you first on active travel and then... <laughs> I think... I think I will go to Brian first, then I'll perhaps Pat and then Nicola. And then uh, I think we may have to, have to wrap things up. Brian. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, I agree with you. I'm like a walking, cycling person. But, yeah, um, th the way I normally spot people who think like that is the, the designing a scheme and then we go, we've got a bit of space. Should we put a little bit of public realm there? <laughs> well, there's some public realm on the corner there, which is like a, yeah, what does that mean? Oh, there'll just be a little bit of space left. Up. Yeah, go get creative there. It's, it's usually the opposite way around. And go, well, you know, the whole thing's the public realm. <laughs> and um, like, well, what we've attempted to do at Active Travel England, just to be a little bit more government, is like a define place making from a technical perspective. At least, well, have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? So at least people can start putting out with the other things like, uh, does the modelling work? How much green time will be given here to get through those lights? All those things will be front and centre, but unless we can get all those other technical considerations for how you make something work for children, how do you make a great place where people will hang out and spend money and socialise? All these things are great for the economy as well. So we, we've attempted to quantify them and get everybody in, in certainly my profession to, to think about it. So that's, that's our way of tackling it. Well, thanks, you. Um, I think that's a really, again, a really valid question. Um, all journeys are crazes and founded in place. They are born from a place. <laughs> and there's no, without place, there's no journey. And without journey, um, there's no place, really, clearly. So it sounds a bit daft, but I think if we don't get this, again, embedded in our transport planning. I think place comes first. And from there, journeys are being born. And those journeys may take you to local school. They may take you to the supermarket. They may take you to the GP. And this is where you get uh, an, uh, create or have a need for short distance journeys. And active travel really suit solutions are quite suitable for, for many people in, in that space. Um, local bus journeys may be very suitable in that space. And then you think a little bit further afield, if it's a connection into a, a site of employment or a location where people need to go to work, that may be a little bit further afield and that may require different types of journeys, like a tram journey, like um, a short, short distance rail journey, um, a longer distance bus journey. So you need to start building that picture, but all of it is born from place. So if we do not get this right, by integrating local authority plans with, for example, mayoral combined authority plans and transport authority plans, then we are, are missing, going to miss the mark. And I think we can do a lot, lot better in, in joining our forces um, with our local authority colleagues in particular for mayoral combined authorities. Um, and that's what we're in the process of doing. So, Nicola, final thoughts from you on this one? Uh, yes, I'm in violent agreement with that, Hugh, as you'd probably expect me to say. Um, I'm a plan planner who came into transport as a, as a planner and interested in place and people and rather than 
transport networks first. Um, so yeah, couldn't agree more. There was, um, I was thinking back to um, a few years ago uh, when I was a consultant and looking at a DRT scheme that had been put in and doing some evaluation. Um, and we went in and did some focus groups in this community that was a very isolated community. I won't say where, um, very deprived. Um, and we said, oh, we're about to see what impact does this demand responsive transport system are made? And they're like, well, it's a lovely bus service, but it just takes me to places within my estate. And there's like one really rubbish food store here, which is really overpriced. And all the places I want to go to aren't on the estate. And yet this bus service just runs around and around. <laughs> and just like, so that was a transport solution <laughs> to a problem that, well, it could have been, there might have been a transport solution, which was to take, actually take people off the estate to the place they want to go, or to actually provide some of those services in the local area. So an affordable food shop, some of the services, some of the employment that they wanted in the local area. Um, but there was transport funding, so we put a transport solution in. Um, but that's just a classic one of not, really understanding what the issues were that the people were facing in that area and coming up with a very nice solution but the wrong solution to meet their problems. So, yeah, we definitely need to start with people and we definitely need to understand the places we're working in much, much more effectively. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm, um, it, it's half past 12, um, so I'm going to just try and draw things to, to a close. Um, thank you, first of all, for making the time to be here this morning. Thank you for the good questions um, and a massive thank you to the panel. Um, for all of your comments. I mean, you know, when I, when I always talk about Transform the North, I always say, together we can transform the North. And I think this point about joining forces comes through place first and people first. Let's go and ask people, let's ask different people, let's be aware of our unconscious biases and make sure we're talking to the communities that we want to benefit and work out what they need rather than going, it's a roundabout, it's an underpass, Let, let's work out what they need. Because I think your point, Brian, it's all public realm. It's all about how we, we move around from places. But what has come through as well is actually it's really powerful to be talking about transport-related social exclusion. It's really powerful to be ambitious about wanting to change it. And perhaps, Jason, I think that the follow-through there is actually we need to get more, more ambitious at the national level, your point about a, a national transport strategy. Um, and I think there is, and, and she's actually just walked back in, Kirsten Keane, who's our bus lead at Transport for the North. Kirsten, we've had a load of questions about buses, so you're going to be busy this afternoon. Um, but I think the other point I must just bring out as well is, is, your, is your comment, Councillor, about safety. Um, and actually, you know, part of the reason I know for a fact that friends won't go on public transport is they don't feel safe. Um, and I have my moments when I've got to the train home later from Manchester at night or even walking back from the train station in what's a relatively nice area where I live, I don't feel safe. So what is it that we can do? And I have to say, I was over with, with Rachelle and the team over at uh, Nexus a couple of weeks ago, and actually just on the fantastic new trains being built for the Metro, the CCTV is amazing. The view through the carriages are amazing to just make people feel less in enclosed spaces. It's some of that design. And you know what they've done? They've done that in consultation with the public. They've run focus groups. They've talked to all the communities. And actually, they've designed a train that looks good, you feel safe on, and actually has got disabled access. It's got access for cyclists, whatever, whatever you might need. So it does go to show, in your point about the cycle route, that actually if we do engage people, if we put people and places first, maybe rather than thinking, is it road, is it rail, we might actually get somewhere. Thank you all very much.